Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Um, today I wanted to talk about a book that I kept on seeing sort of hyped up a little bit and kind of getting a bit of love um, that's recently out and that is The New Life by Tom Crew. Um, and this book kind of took me a bit by surprise because I think I hadn't really initially heard much of a, a splash around it and then just sort of felt like there was just this little bit of hype growing from a few people um, who just really seemed to enjoy it. So I thought I would give it a, a chance and luckily my library had it. Uh, so I... This is a really weird preamble to just being like, I read the book um, and I, I loved it. I think this is such a fascinating book. Um, I will be talking a bit about spoilers later, but there'll be the, the first section will be spoiler free. Um, but I think just overall, this is just such a gorgeous, generous, um, warm hearted book. I think um, this book is all about um, two men in particular, but the sort of lives around them. Um, who during a very specific time, the sort of Victorian era in England, are trying to argue for the um, the the legalization or the acceptance to some degree of um, of relationships between uh, largely for them between men, but also in the wider scale um, between you know any kind of same sex attraction or, or anything like that. And so, this book starts with this kind of understanding that there are these two men who we're going to be following throughout the book, both of whom live in very different circumstances, but are both wrangling with um, what it means to discover that they're attracted to men in a society that doesn't understand it firstly, and definitely isn't really tolerating it. Um, so for these two men, this this sort of builds and builds. And we know, at least from the, the synopsis, so this isn't a spoiler, but we know from the outset that there will be something where they're working together for them to really think about how they are going to try and further the cause um, of of public understanding around this in a time that is not going to be particularly well understood. Um, and I just think it's a really stunning, gorgeous book. I think what is particularly so brilliant about it, and this doesn't, this isn't a spoiler, um, is that it, the book itself kind of plays the same game that the characters are playing in the sense of we as an audience are put in a position where we are starting to read between the lines of coded queer language between between these men. So at one point there are a series of letters written um, between the sort of these two central men. And what we find in that is that there are all of these subtle references to people like Walt Whitman, um, you know, a, 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 I don't think he necessarily used this word himself, but modern day, you know, we'd either call him a gay man or a queer man or, or something like that. But Walt Whitman had these poems talking in great depth about the love of men and the male body and all of these other things. I love Walt Whitman. He's fantastic. Leaves of Grass is one of my favourite, favourite things of all time. Um, and the the sort of subtleties within those letters are that same process. These two men are basically trying to transmit this message to each other that they themselves are gay men um, or that they are into men in some form. And they're trying to coordinate, uh, communicate this to each other in a way with where if the letter were to be found, they're not caught out themselves. So, you know, there are lots of really subtle references to um, certain books that they've read that are by authors who are suspected of being gay. Um, there are certain articles referenced or certain word choices that are intentionally there to kind of signal to the people who will get it. Um, and, you know, fly over the heads of, of people who don't get it, um, which I just thought was brilliant. It's such a clever way of us as the audience also feeling that, particularly as it's written in a fairly sort of Victorian-esque style. Um, not in a way that I actually found off-putting. I think it was still incredibly accessible and engaging. But that kind of capturing of language um, and of us as the audience being part of that puzzle, I thought was really clever as well. And I think as uh, for me on a sort of personal level, I don't think I've really seen that reflected in books in quite this way of there is something unique to the experience, I think, of being an LGBTQ plus person um, and, you know, for, for many other minority groups really as well of the moment somebody knows that information about yourself, you can potentially be in danger or you can potentially find community. 
And the only real way to navigate that is to find certain ways of speaking or certain cultural references or touch points or little nods to certain things that mean you can get away with it. And this was the kind of case of um, the old uh, sort of language or sort of dialect, whatever people call it, um, of Polari. This, the whole idea was that you could throw in a phrase or a word it would avoid detection and just sound like a bit of a funny local dialect word to people who didn't get it. But to people who did get it, they would know instantly that you were one of them and that there was a moment of safety. There was also within Polari the, the opportunity to be able to communicate in front of other people without being um, without fear of being detected. But anyway, um, all of these things, I think, go into what this book is in its way of examining how these two men talk to each other. And that's not even the main part of the plot, really. <laughs> like, the main part of the plot really is sort of these two men coming together to write this book um, in which they have gathered the stories of lots of men talking about being attracted to other men and trying to almost make this a scientific book to argue scientifically that these people exist and they should be treated with compassion. Um, but in the meantime, we've got these two men essentially arguing with each other about how exactly this is going to happen. What does it look like to do this? Um, and with that, I'm going to start going into some spoilers. So I'll, I'll leave you there. But um, it is a beautiful, beautiful book, um, if you're dropping off now. Um, and I really do strongly urge you to read it. I think it's a, a really intelligent and clever and heartfelt book. So that's just really just talking about the linguistic element of it. But I think this book does so, so much more in terms of the characters um, around these two central men. So our first ma man is uh, having this sort of, the, we basically start the book with a really intense sexual fantasy on a train. <laughs> um, and uh, I was re I started reading this book on a train. I was like, okay, this is really uncomfortable if anyone ever looks over my shoulder on this. <laughs> like, this is, um, but what, I think was so interesting about it is it talk it, it, the way this book expresses desire and the strength of desire um is is stunning i think is really beautifully captured but this our first man he basically cruises someone in a park and there's this sort of class difference between uh, between frank this sort of working class man and our central man um whose name i keep forgetting um, and that's the, the sort of the real beauty, I think, with these between these two men with Henry, I think it is, and, and Frank is this, we've kind of initially got this kind of class based relationship that's a bit complicated. He also himself has a, um, a wife. And so there's this kind of complicated thing about how much does she know? And if she does know how much does she care? Turns out she cares a fair bit. Um, and then we jump to our other man, John. And he is the, he has a, a male lover himself, but also has this wife, um, who, um, Edith, who is, there's a very strange relationship between them in the sense that they both acknowledge their relationship to each other as husband and wife in a strong sense of, I'm, we're looking after each other. We do care for each other. It's just not a romantic or sexual thing. But Edith herself has Angelica, this this um, woman she is in love with. And so in some ways, this relationship allows them both to go under the radar. You know, when he's initially publishing this book or thinking about publishing this book, John has the luxury potentially of being able to disappear because he can say, oh, well, look, I'm a married man. Um, I, I'm just curious about this this phenomenon or this this thing. I just wanted to get to the, the heart of it for science. Um, and so there's this there's this real conversation in the book about the the certain ways that certain people can exist untroubled in this society and the ways that some people absolutely cannot so this working class man um frank even even in circles of other um ostensibly queer people he's often still seen as being unworthy because he's this sort of working class man and, you know, like, oh, where did you find him kind of thing. And for some of the, you know, the women in the book have their own ways of being sidelined because, you know, 
in one case she is you know one, one of the wives is having to just put up with a husband who she's just realized does not love her and probably never will and who is potentially using her as a bit of a human shield um, for, to avoid detection for his sexuality. In the other case, we've got, you know, two women in a relationship who can't ever really be recognised and can't ever really um, find a way of, of being safe unless one of them or both of them um, have a marriage to a man there. And so there's this really complicated thing uh, in the book around this almost this idea of passing or kind of going undetected, um, which I think is so brilliant in terms of understanding what it would be like for these characters. It felt incredibly real, incredibly um, uh, authentic to kind of focus on characters in this way. And all of them are just building really towards this one hope of the new life, of being able to find what matters to them and what will give them sort of peace and acceptance and, and various other things. And I think the book does that really beautifully in terms of capturing a side that we don't often see. You know, we people tend to talk about it as if gay people were invented in the 50s and 60s as part of like the hippie free love movement or that, you know, gay people didn't exist until Stonewall or, or you know, whatever else. People often frame a lot of gay rights um, and, and sort of LGBTQ rights discussions as if it only ever started then. Whereas actually here we have characters who are fighting that fight in a very different way, in a very different time, under very different circumstances, but they're fighting nonetheless. Um, but actually still within it, this is so full of love and sexiness and and passion. There's, it's, you know, it, it feels like it's pushing back against this idea that, um, you know, it's only in recent times that certain things have happened or, you know, it, it, there's a real love, I think, in this book. Um, of how these characters are finding strength um, and where they're cowardly um, in, in all of that. So anyway, I'm going to leave that there. But I think this is a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, I really, really highly recommend it. I think it deals so well with issues of detection and shame and love and passion and so many other things. Um, I think it's brilliant. So I do really urge you to check it out. I've been Bob the Booker talking about this book. I'd love to hear your thoughts if you've read it. Um, I also really just want to see this book, you know, being loved this year. I kind of, I hope, I hope it's one of those books that sort of takes off a bit. Um, I've been Bob. Take care and speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.